Hi, my name is Megan Kelly Herbst, and I'm going to be talking about performing and interpreting transvaginal pelvic ultrasound. We will be covering the indications, preparation, and a systematic approach to the transvaginal ultrasound exam, and then I'll discuss how to differentiate an intrauterine pregnancy from no definitive intrauterine pregnancy. At the end, there will be slides on ovarian pathology, which is important to recognize but beyond the scope of emergency physicians. Three indications for transvaginal ultrasound in the emergency medicine setting include confirming an early intrauterine pregnancy when transabdominal ultrasound is not adequate, evaluating etiologies for pain or vaginal bleeding in an HCG positive female, and evaluating acute pelvic pain that may be explained by ovarian pathology. Before performing a transvaginal ultrasound exam, there are several steps necessary prior to the actual exam. First, attempt a transabdominal ultrasound to evaluate the patient's symptoms. The uterus and ovaries are best visualized when the patient has a full bladder. The anechoic fluid in the bladder acts as an acoustic window for the sound waves to travel through and better illuminate the more posterior uterus and ovaries. The bladder also moves air-filled bowel loops out of the way. If you do not see the uterus and ovaries clearly, proceed by having the patient completely empty her bladder. When she returns, have her lay in a gynecologic stretcher, or if using a standard stretcher, raise the patient's pelvis by placing a bedpan and several blankets beneath her pelvis. This will allow you to better visualize an antiverted uterus, which 70 to 80% of women have. The above image depicts a standard gynecologic stretcher. However, if this is not available, please note the lower three images, illustrating the use of an upside-down bedpan with chalks placed on top, all of which are then placed beneath the patient's pelvis. Attach a sanitized endocavitary probe to your ultrasound machine and place a probe cover of your choice over the probe tip. Make sure there is a small amount of gel between the probe tip and the probe cover without air bubbles. Before inserting the probe, empty a packet of sterile surgical lube onto the covered probe tip. The endocavitary probe is shaped somewhat like a rifle. The indicator is on the top, opposite the trigger, towards the tip. Some patients prefer to insert the probes themselves at the start of your exam. When inserting the probe, the indicator should face up towards the ceiling. This will give you a sagittal view of the pelvis. Rock the probe anteriorly and posteriorly and fan it side to side to evaluate the shape of the uterus as well as the presence or absence of free fluid in the pelvis, usually seen in the pouch of Douglas. Here is a cartoon to help better orient yourself anatomically. On the left is an illustration that may be familiar from Dr. Ng's lecture. The probe is entering at the level of the cervix. And because whatever is closest to the probe's footprint is at the top of the screen, the cervix is visualized at the top of the screen. For this reason, the structures we see on a transvaginal ultrasound will be upside down. After adequately viewing the uterus in a sagittal cut, turn the indicator 90 degrees counterclockwise so that the indicator is now pointing to the patient's right. This will give you a transverse, or more accurately, a coronal view of the pelvis. The bladder will be seen inferior to the uterus, and the fallopian tubes, though rarely seen, will take off from the corneal flares to the right and left of the uterus. After completing your view of the uterus, keep the indicator to the patient's right, and direct the tip of the probe towards the patient's right adnexa. Fan the probe anteriorly and posteriorly until the right ovary comes into view. It will be hypoechoic and well circumscribed with anechoic round follicles within it. It has often been referred to as having the appearance of a chocolate chip cookie. The ovaries are medial to the iliac vessels. Take a look at the right ovary in sagittal view, then return the probe back to a transverse position and without changing the plane of the probe, direct the tip towards the left adnexa. The left ovary is usually found at the same level as the right. Once the tip is in the left adnexa, if you do not see the left ovary, fan the probe anteriorly and posteriorly until it comes into view. 
Again, make sure you see the left ovary in a sagittal plane as well. Now that you've learned how to perform a systematic transvaginal pelvic ultrasound, we'll move on to our second objective. The following slides will address how to distinguish between an intrauterine pregnancy and no definitive intrauterine pregnancy. You should always attempt a transabdominal pelvic ultrasound first. Using a sagittal view, your landmarks for the uterus will be the bladder and the vaginal stripe. You need to see at least a gestational sac within the uterus containing a yolk sac or a fetal heartbeat to conclude a patient has a viable intrauterine pregnancy. Furthermore, the gestational sac should always be surrounded by at least 8 millimeters of endomyometrium. The surrounding endomyometrium is called the endomyometrial or uterine mantle. When an IUP cannot be confirmed via transabdominal ultrasound, a transvaginal ultrasound is in order. The following slides will illustrate each of the following IUP criteria. The double decidual sign, yolk sac, fetal heartbeat, and uterine mantle over eight millimeters. The yolk sac and fetal heartbeat are most important to recognize. The double decidual sign consists of two echogenic rings surrounding the anechoic gestational sac. The inner ring represents the chorion, embryonic disc, and decidua capsularis. The outer ring represents the decidua parietalis, also referred to as decidua vera. Where the two adhere is the decidua basalis and is the site of future placental formation. By week five to six of gestation, a yolk sac should be visualized. It is the first element seen in the gestational sac during pregnancy and looks like a small Cheerio. By six to seven weeks gestation, a fetal heartbeat should be visualized. It often appears as a flicker and should be measured via M mode once detected. A normal fetal heart rate is typically 110 to 180 beats per minute, with a slower rate observed at 6 weeks and a faster rate observed around 10 weeks. Here's another example. And another example. Keep in mind you always want at least 8 millimeters of endomyometrium surrounding the gestational sac. If there is less than 8 millimeters, consider that the pregnancy could be ectopically implanted within the uterus. If you are not able to identify a double decidual sign, yolk sac, or fetal heart rate in an HCG positive female, the patient has no definitive intrauterine pregnancy or an NDIUP. Here's one example of an NDIUP. We are looking at a small sac in the uterus that is not surrounded by a double decidual sign. This is called a pseudo sac. A pseudo sac may indicate a very early pregnancy, but may also be present in ectopic pregnancies. Here's a second example of an NDIUP. We are looking at a sagittal view of the uterus, with the bladder seen anteriorly and inferiorly, and within the uterus there is a hypoechoic area that lacks a surrounding double decidual sign or yolk sac. On closer inspection, it still lacks a double decidual sign or yolk sac, and likely represents a clot or polyp in the endometrium. This third case of an NDIUP shows an empty uterus viewed sagittally with surrounding free fluid, as well as hyperechoic material likely representing clot. In any HCG positive female with an empty uterus and free fluid, always suspect ruptured ectopic. This final case of an NDIUP was an HCG positive female with an IUD who was presenting with pain and tachycardia. A transabdominal view was adequate in identifying large amounts of free fluid in the pelvis, and the patient was taken immediately to the OR for suspected ruptured ectopic.
This brings me to a very important point. A patient who is HCG positive and has free fluid in the pelvis or in Morrison's pouch has an ectopic pregnancy until proven otherwise. Free fluid with echoes suggests hemoperitoneum with high positive predictive value for operative ectopic pregnancy. Here's an example of fluid in Morrison's pouch. If you see this in an HCG positive female, be concerned for a ruptured ectopic. And here's an example of fluid in the pelvis. The uterus is visualized in a transverse plane. A major advantage of transvaginal ultrasound is the earlier gestational age at which the diagnosis of an ectopic can be made. An intact and well-defined tubal ring, commonly referred to as the bagel sign, is seen medial to the right ovary in this clip. While not evident here, you may see a yolk sac, fetal pole, and heartbeat within the tubal ring. A different patient, this clip depicts a tubal ring medial to the left ovary. The discriminatory zone is the quantitative beta HCG level above which you should see an intrauterine pregnancy. For transvaginal ultrasound, this value is between 1,000 and 2,000. The discriminatory zone is not used to rule out an ectopic pregnancy. In other words, if a patient presents with abdominal pain and has a beta HCG of 300, if you do not see an IUP, do not assume that it is too early in her pregnancy to see anything. Pay attention to her symptoms and consult OBGYN if you suspect ectopic. Because ectopic pregnancies do not produce HCG in the same way that IUPs do, Large ectopic pregnancies and ruptured ectopic pregnancies have been associated with beta HCGs as low as 200. Recent evidence has also shown that some women with HCGs above the discriminatory zone and no definitive IUP can still progress to have a normal pregnancy. Again, while any pregnant female with an NDIUP should be evaluated for ectopic pregnancy, if free fluid is visualized in such a patient, that patient has a ruptured ectopic until proven otherwise, and OBGYN should be consulted immediately. If the beta HCG is under 1,000 and the patient is well appearing with normal vital signs, it is reasonable to discharge her after discussing with OBGYN and arranging prompt follow-up in 48 hours. The last segment of this lecture looks at ovarian pathology, which is beyond the scope of point-of-care ultrasound, but should be recognized when encountered. Free fluid may be pathologic, and the table here lists a differential for free fluid in the pregnant patient and non-pregnant patient. Having already covered ultrasonographic findings for an ectopic pregnancy, we will focus on ovarian cysts, torsion, and salpingitis. Ovarian cysts are defined as cystic structures of the ovary measuring 2.5 centimeters or greater. They may be simple, thin-walled, fluid-filled follicular cysts, or they may be complex with thick walls, septations, or heterogeneous material within them. Corpus luteum and hemorrhagic cysts are two kinds commonly seen and will be discussed in the following slides. Keep in mind that the risk of ovarian torsion increases with the presence of ovarian cysts or masses. Here's an example of a simple cyst on the left ovary. Note the thin wall and the anechoic fluid within it. A closer view shows some follicles within the left ovary inferiorly. Here's an example of a corpus luteum cyst in the setting of an IUP. Corpus luteum cysts result from an LH surge after ovulation and will persist during the first two to three months of pregnancy. They can reach up to 10 centimeters in diameter. Corpus luteum cysts, among others, may fill with blood and rupture, potentially leading to hemodynamic compromise. 
Here's an example of a hemorrhagic ovarian cyst with heterogeneous echoes within it. Notice also the echoes surrounding the cyst, likely representing clot. This clip from a non-pregnant female with right lower quadrant pain shows a small complex cyst of the right ovary with surrounding anechoic fluid. The fluid may represent a ruptured cyst or may be the result of ovarian torsion. Ovarian torsion is again beyond the scope of emergency physician-performed ultrasound. An adnexal cyst or mass is present in most cases of ovarian torsion. However, up to a quarter of cases of ovarian torsion occur in normal ovaries. Adolescents make up the largest number of cases of torsion in normal ovaries. The most common sonographic finding for ovarian torsion is ovarian enlargement. This is because venous obstruction occurs before arterial obstruction, leading to an increased number of follicles and a more edematous and enlarged ovary over time. Pelvic inflammatory disease is caused by the entrapment of sexually transmitted bacteria in the fallopian tube, creating a hydro or pyosalpinx. On ultrasound, this is seen as a fluid-filled tube with occasional hyperechoic linear structures representing the thickened endosalpingeal folds. A cross-section of the thick-walled tube appears as a sonolucent wheel-shaped structure. We call this the cogwheel sign. A complication of pelvic inflammatory disease includes the formation of tubovarian abscesses. This appears as an ovarian mass containing loculations or hypochoic purulent material which sometimes moved when pressed upon. To summarize, Always perform a transvaginal ultrasound in a systematic fashion. You will have a more successful exam and reduce your chance of missing pathology. An HCG positive female with no definitive intrauterine pregnancy has an ectopic pregnancy until proven otherwise. Free fluid visualized in the pelvis may be an indication of pathology. And finally, while beyond the scope of our practice, utilizing ovarian ultrasonography will improve our ability to recognize ovarian pathology. Thank you for listening, and I hope this helps with future transvaginal ultrasound exams.